and thank uh, the organizers very, very much for uh, inviting me. It's certainly a privilege to be here today, and uh, hopefully I will share some information with you uh, about turbulence, where it was, which we heard a little bit about this morning, uh, and where we're going with it, and what's the, what's the future. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been touched on today is um, the proliferation of turbulence models and how prevalent they are in the commercial solvers and how many people use them in a variety of uh, disciplines. There, over the years, there's been criticisms of turbulence models and how uh, poorly they've done and we've not made enough progress as we just, uh, as we just heard. But I think it's sometimes it's worth sitting down and looking at <clears throat> where we've been and what we really have accomplished <coughs> in the field and how successful we've been. And I think uh, w when I finish this, hopefully you'll have an appreciation that we have come a long way uh, and that uh, we do have obviously advances we need to make both in modeling and, and simulations. So uh, with that, let me, let me start. Some of it's, this will be a little bit of a repeat from what we heard, of what uh, Frank Harlow said. Certainly he was one of the pioneers in the early years. I remember when I was uh, just starting out as a graduate student, uh, my PhD thesis was on viscoelastic fluids, which mathematically are very similar to uh, the Reynolds stress transport equations. And in some ways, there's a relationship between viscoelastic fluids, complex fluids, and turbulence, complex flows. Uh, Ronald Rivlin made that analogy back in 1955 of the similarity between the two. So it wasn't such a, a diverse field. But earlier today, we certainly heard uh, about CFD. What is CFD? That was addressed this morning. What is CFD? I guess in some ways, we all have our different concepts of what's CFD. Uh, it's certainly applicable to laminar and turbulent flows. We've seen so many excellent examples today. Uh, subsonic and supersonic slash hypersonic flows. We've seen a lot of examples. We haven't seen too much in the supersonic regime. I'm going to show you some things. And now simulations are being done in the hypersonic regime. So there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of interest there. Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids or viscoelastic fluids in some cases. There's been applications of that, and some recently there's been some direct numerical simulations of uh, viscoelastic fluids. With and without heat transfer, certainly uh, Professor Spalding has been instrumental in incorporating the connection between heat and mass transfer and, and, uh, and the fluid flow problem. And the other effects, MHD, reactions, non-reacting flows. But as you look back over the history of uh, uh, CFD, and as it applies to turbulence, which will be obviously the focus of my talk, there's been a connection between the tool and the modeling. And I think as we look at this history that I'm going to go through today, we have to appreciate that coupling and how that's affected how we do turbulent flow problems. And then in a sense, this will be a retrospective look where we were, are, and uh, I'll try to do some, uh, uh, some stargazing here and some uh, uh, looking in the crystal ball and speculate where we're going to be going in the relatively uh, near future. Well, there's some pacing items for CFD. <clears throat> there's, in a sense, three of them that I feel are important, and that's first, first off, turbulent model development. As far as turbulent model development, we could go back to the late 1800s with Osborne Reynolds in 1895, where he developed the concepts of averaging, and that, so we, we knew how to examine the instantaneous behavior of turbulent flows by looking at some sort of statistical average. And we, from that, of course, you can develop a set of equations, and uh, from these equations you find, because of the nonlinear advection terms, that you always have a closure problem. And hence, that's what precipitated this enormous effort in turbulence modeling. You all, every time you formulated these equations, you had needs to uh, come up with models for the higher order correlations. Uh, numerical algorithm development. As we heard earlier today, there was all, over the whole 20th century, there was developments in difference methods and algorithm type methods. 
But when you started getting to the situation where you developed, uh, out, you needed algorithms for the Navier-Stokes equations plus transport equations for turbulent correlations, which were relatively stiff numerically, that became somewhat problematic and what could be realistically done. And of course, the issues became discretization errors, numerical dissipation, time stepping restrictions. All these pieces were laying about throughout the middle of the 20th century, but hadn't been crystallized in one package where we could start moving forward with actually solving these average or filtered equations. Uh, just as a prelude to keep in mind, I'm going to constantly keep putting into this filtered equations because you, this is going to show you where we are going in uh, with CFD and turbulence modeling. So while we've heard most of the discussion today talk about averaged equations, we're, I'm going to also throw into the mix the concept of filtered equations, and you'll see a little bit why I'm emphasizing that point. The other thing that came about was computational resources. CFD, as far as turbulence goes, has been uh, the uh, computational resources have been an integral part of the development and the type of CFD we do for turbulent flow. Uh, issues associated with memory and speed and scalability, now scalability with the clusters that we use, really paced the field in, a, in some ways. And I'll get into that now. Okay, as a prologue, let's, where did all this start in a sense with what we understood CFD and turbulent model equations to be. And first off, as I said, Osborne Reynolds in 1895 introduced this concept of averaging. And we got then the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, and as I pointed out in the last uh, uh, slide, that these equations always introduce higher order correlations that need to be modeled or closed. Uh, two early models for closure were in 1942 and 1945. This was alluded to earlier, but I want to emphasize the years that these were done in. And in 1942 in Russia, uh, that was not necessarily an optim optimal time to be doing turbulence modeling, and that was presented by Komogorov uh, to the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences outside of Moscow because at that time the... Uh, the uh, 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 the Nazis were outside of uh, Moscow, so they had to move outside the city. So that was not necessarily a time when there was much communication about these ideas. And then in 1945, shortly after the war, Pranto introduced what was the prelude to what we call one equation models. But what's, uh, and this slide here, and I'm going to show this quite a few times throughout my talk, we were back here in the 40s, so we had Komogoros ideas based on the, uh, the, uh, the Russian work at the time. Uh, Pranto, who used some of his earlier work from 1925 and some of the ideas of von Karman, were, uh, was formulating uh, uh, his one equation model, Komogar, was a two equation model, and we were starting back here. I didn't put on the subsequent uh, uh, people who were working around the same time. A child in 1945, he started looking at the pressure strain rate correlation. Even at that time, he was looking at uh, the equations for the, for the uh, turbulent core, uh, uh, velocity second moments. And Rada in 1951, who was following along in the ideas of uh, Pranto. So those, those four were around this area. I tried only on this uh, schematic here to basically show the uh, people who started, uh, really started the path. Uh, what was interesting about that, you go back to the original papers from 1942, this was the equation set that Komogor wrote. And uh, this is one reason why maybe the criticism about we've not made any progress in turbulence modeling is valid. Since this was 1942, I wrote down the current model form, modern form, for these two equations, and as you can see, there's a lot of similarity. D, of course, is the kinetic energy uh, that we have here. You can see these terms, epsilon bar is the uh, mean velocity gradient squared, and the turbulent transport term is, uh, is given here. You can see for the turbulent kinetic energy equation, there's a lot of similarity. 
Uh, uh, in all fairness, though, Paul McGuire basically was thinking of an isotropic type turbulence. That is, uh, basically, uh, there is a fluctuating velocity, and this is basically a third of the RMS value is his B. But in any event, the, whether the, that or the kinetic energy, you can see the similarity in the equations, a production term, a destruction term, and a turbulent transport term. However, uh, for the frequency, he used the frequency, which became popular now as the K omega model, um, he used the frequency, but he had a destruction term. He didn't have a production term. And he had a transport term. He didn't have the production term because his understanding of the problem was that at the dissipation range, you basically only had sinks of energy. He did not make the connection with that the source of this, the amount of dissipation, the level that you have to dissipate at, was really dictated by a production level of the large scales. He did not, that was one deficiency in his thinking, so he never did have a production term in his model. He never was able to test it either, of course, because what didn't he have? He didn't have the resources to do the calculation at the time. This is the first example of, here was the theory, there was no tool to do the theory. Let's go to uh, Prado in 1945. He went the opposite. He went another approach. Obviously, the two did not uh, weren't communicating. Uh, he went the other approach, and he did a one equation model, which later would be called an incomplete model. And basically, the reason it's called an incomplete model is no matter how you look, something has to be said about the turbulent lens scale. We're back to the lens scale, which has always been a deficiency or a problem in doing turbulence modeling. So uh, what he needed here was a lens scale specification. And going back to today's modern form for the K equation, the kinetic energy equation, you can see that uh, the same thing appears. Epsilon, the dissipation rate, which is what had been used initially for the turbulence scale, is given by this quantity here, whereas the, uh, the, the burden now shifts from specifying a length scale to now deducing a more complete quantity, and that's, in fact, the dissipation rate. So uh, this was the one equation model form. So back in the 40s, we had the, the, we had the basis for a two equation model we would follow and the first one equation models that we would need. So, to emphasize that, we had available the fundamental concepts, we had average mean variables, the Reynolds average variables. We knew from the research that occurred in the 20s and 30s and a little bit in the 40s, uh, the statistical behavior of turbulence, they understood that concept very well, and the concept of introducing partial differential equations to describe the turbulent evolution of the statistical quantities had been conceived. Uh, so we have the Rand's equations and we have the Reynolds stress transport equations. What didn't we have available at the time? We didn't have the computational tools. Algorithms of a sufficient robustness and more importantly, usable digi digital computers. So aside from the fact that it was not the best uh, time to be doing research, at that the world had other things on its mind obviously at that time, there was a void where progress essentially leveled off. During the 50s, I don't have much here other than uh, the one I mentioned about uh, uh, Julius Rada. Uh, during the 50s, there was a lot of work, though, in turbulence. And it was done at, uh, on, uh, uh, in uh, compressible flows. There was a lot of work being done in compressible flows on looking at analogies between heat, heat transfer and the, and, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the velocity field. In the uh, incompressible case, there was a lot of uh, work done by Batchelor and Townsend in understanding uh, uh, homogeneous turbulence. And basically, that was the research in the, um, in the uh, 50s. I would think, as I look back over the literature, the biggest progress back then was in the area of compressible flows, which is not necessarily the topic of, uh, uh, of my talk today. But that's where most of the turbulence research was focused. And I think it, that was motivated by the fact that at the end of the war, there was a lot of interest in high-speed flows, and they, people wanted to pursue that. 
and the idea of rockets and, and that were certainly being developed at, at the time. Not, not rockets themselves, but the fluid dynamics associated with high-speed uh, propulsion systems. Uh, okay, let's then move on to the uh, 60s. Uh, in the 60s, things started to happen. There was no mention today, let me just make sure, yep. Um, there was no mention today of Smagorinsky. While we heard a lot about average equations, there was something very, very important going on, and that was by Smagorinsky, and he was the one that looked at the concept of large eddy simulation for the first time. They were applying it to weather predictions, and his paper appeared in Monthly Weather Review, so it wasn't well, uh, uh, re it wasn't known to the engineering community, but that laid the framework, as you might suspect, for what happened later on in the in the 70s. And then, of course, as we heard this morning, there was a lot of work by the group at uh, Los Alamos, and, but in 1967, and this is the way I looked at the turn of events in that time, as I have a copy of Heat and Mass Transfer. Uh, I don't have it on this slide, I have it on the next one. But there was uh, the book that was published by Patanko and Spalding in 1967, was the first printing and then the, the 69 printing. And I look at that book and I really get a feel that, to me, was the really start of something. Uh, the papers I saw from the, um, from the Los Alamos group, there was a tremendous amount of papers starting as far as turbulent transport equations go, like 67, maybe there was one in 66, but 67, 68, 69, there was a lot of work coming out of the Los Alamos. And having worked for NASA for many years, I certainly understood that a lot of the excellent work they were doing was probably published in internal reports initially, and then you have to wait a certain period to be able to publish them in the open literature. But the important thing is, what was available? Well, the advances in numerical algorithms were such that now you can actually do something, and the computational resources, as we heard this morning in the issue about what, was, what uh, computers were available, the IBM computers, uh, the computational research, uh, resources were in fact available. But uh, this here is taken from Smagorinsky's paper, which I think is really telling. Uh, he mentioned there were two solution approaches were recognized. He was talking in this uh, monthly weather review paper he had written uh, about what, how they should go about solving, uh, do better in forecasting. And he came up with two possibilities. One, to treat transient dynamics of the large-scale motions explicitly, and then to calculate the statistical mechanics of the evolutions, okay? The second was to treat the large-scale motions as turbulence, which is somehow related to the mean properties of the flow. And he came to the conclusion, because of the problem he had to solve, he said, well, looks like this leaves course one as the painful alternative, because he didn't think he knew enough to go to that approach, that is, he didn't think he knew enough to do the modeling of the large-scale turbulence and relate it to the properties of the mean flow. So that was the basis for them migrating to course one, and as we later found, the prelude, the development of the Smagorinsky model. Uh, so he thought, well, okay, we're gonna account for the subscale motions, and as I said, a prelude to the large eddy simulation. So keep that in mind. Uh, the engineering community, because we had different problems we were looking at, we didn't have these, you know, uh, scales over several kilometers, the uh, engineering community migrated to option two to treat the large scale motions as turbulence, which is somehow related to the mean properties of flow. That is, let's model the whole spectrum and we'll relate that to the um, mean, temp uh, mean velocities. <coughs> okay, here's a plot. Um, uh, of the evolution of the computers, uh, the trend of supercomputer speed up uh, going back from around 1940 all the way through to 2000. I have a follow on from uh, 1990 uh, extending this. But uh, it's interesting here, they didn't put the MANIAC on here. I, uh, I found that interesting. They have the ENIAC, the UNIVAC. Uh, it's interesting the ones that are missing. I thought that, I thought that this is from Riken, which is a uh, research group in Japan. It's interesting the computers they don't have listed here. But in any event, um, uh, I saw LARC and I tried to dig up what computer we had at Langley around that 
around that period. And the uh, interesting thing, the only thing I came up with was people. Uh, it turned out that at Langley in the 60s, a computer was a person. And, uh, and uh, uh, those people would actually check what was coming out of the computer they had at the time to make sure it was right because the computers were, we don't know if these are really doing the right calculations, or they would actually do the calculation. In fact, uh, when I first joined Langley in uh, 76, or uh, seven, 77, 77, I, uh, we, I was in, being introduced to different people and someone said, well, let's go and meet the computer. Okay, I'll go and meet the, okay, that's fine. So I'm thinking, well, this is gonna be an interesting experience, you know, what do you say? Uh, and so I walk in and, there, and there's this woman sitting there and they said, well, this is our computer. And so it was sort of a little awkward at the start until it was explained to me what, what was not She said, yeah, they would just sit there and just do. In fact, a lot of things for the Mercury launch were done by computers. So uh, they served an important thing. I think they really meant a machine here, but there were actually uh, an official designation as a uh, computer. So that's where things were in the 60s. And as I learned this morning, and uh, having recalled some of these other machines, there were a few other machines out there at the same time. I'm suspecting, though, that their performance was pretty much on these lines right here. And as you can see in the early period, uh, there were, if you took selected machines, the, uh, there was an increase in speed 10 times each 3.8 years which wasn't too bad. So that was the early, that was the early uh, interest, and that's why I think when you saw that, now people knew they had potential to do some calculations, both the group at Los Alamos and the group in, in Imperial College. Okay, uh, as I said, my, uh, I look at the book in 1967, Heat and Mass Transfer and Boundary Layers, Potanko and Spalding, and I really look at that, and you, it's, it's basically a user manual. It's re it's, and that to me says, okay, well that's probably the start of what I would think of as C, uh, C of D. It had uh, algorithm information, it had turbulence theory information, it had a Fortran code, all under one, uh, one cover. And this is what I thought C of D would be. <clears throat> so in 68, just to show that the field had become somewhat mature, <coughs> we had the 68 Stanford Conference, which is computation of turbulent boundary layers. And I, I was talking to, uh, uh, Brian Lounder, uh, a few days ago, who's my co-editor and uh, chief of the International Journal of Heat and Fluid Flow, uh, who was, we heard about this morning, and he told me that uh, that was a uh, stimulating conference. Uh, uh, Brian Spaulding and Peter Bradshaw uh, did not see the same uh, see eye to eye on turbulence modeling at the time, and if you look at uh, the uh, volume, Peter Bradshaw took one approach, that is he basically used uh, uh, turbulent field equations, whereas the group from uh, Imperial College was basically mean field. That is, they would go in and specify a length scale formulation. Peter Bradshaw wanted to solve a transport equation for the turbulent shear stress. So there was an exchange because at the end of uh, the uh, section on the turbulence modeling, they had a discussion and people actually were taking notes of the discussion and the exchange between Peter and Brian was uh, candid and frank, I think would be the best way to phrase it. Um, so the mean field equations, basically any viscosity and mixing length hypotheses, the turbulent field equation, um, you would, uh, they, people used the shear stress transport equation, which was the work of Peter Bradshaw at the time, and, or in any viscosity transport equation, and I ask you to remember that, because something came out of that a few years later. But in 1968 uh, was proposed in any viscosity transport equation. And that, uh, you'll see how history sort of repeats itself when you, when you look at that. <clears throat> okay. Now that we sort of set the stage, and let me uh, just add also about the group at Los Alamos. I, I went back and looked at those papers in physics of fluids, and uh, they, they really had the equations down. They had Reynolds stress transport equations. They made some crude approximations to the key terms like uh, pressure strain rate correlation. They, they were well on their way to really moving on. They didn't ha really get into the consideration of the effects of near wall behavior though, which was one of the things that I, I thought they, they should have been looking at at the time. 
Uh, now, between the 70s and 90s, you can see that uh, basically uh, I don't have any, no new fields with the exception of Tony Leonard, who was Bill Reynolds' student in 1974. And this was the start of the group at Stanford starting to look at large eddy simulations. So that's the key thing that happened in the 70s. Even at that time, uh, even though CFD really started to come into vogue at the late 60s, by 1974, people started realizing, you know, I don't think we can get enough information out of RANS-type models. We may need to do better. And this was one of the things that started in, in 1974. Um, the focus initially after this surge in 1968, the Stanford Conference was a big, big uh, uh, impetus to get a lot of work done. Everybody was there. I did not see in the volume the presence of anyone from Los Alamos, though. There were six talks on turbulence modeling, and not a one was from anyone from Los Alamos. I was a little surprised at that, but having worked for the government, you never know what's the rules and regulations people uh, work under. Uh, so the focus <clears throat> was on complete models, which means we don't want to specify a lens scale and have it change with each different flow we're looking at. We want to solve transport equations for all the quantities we need. Uh, one of the deficiencies, which is still the deficiency of RANS models, is that they're based on equilibrium turbulence dynamics, which means they assume the turbulence has responded completely to the imposed shear on the flow. It's the underlying deficiency of RANS models. It's the formulation that causes it uh, because you're looking at statistically mean quantities, but that's why RANS models simply aren't going to work in some flows. Um, so we have uh, the, the complete models, as I said, would basically be solving partial differential equations for the turbulent velocity correlations, and there would be a specification of uh, turbulent length scale, dissipation rate, or frequency. Um, uh, Wolfstein really pushed uh, quite a bit for length scale formulations. And uh, the Aeronautical Research Associates of Princeton, which I don't think it exists now, I'm not sure. Uh, Cole Donaldson, that was an approach they took in the 70s. And they were, uh, they were some of the key players in model development, along with, of course, the group at Imperial College. Uh, I think in, in the early 70s, the group at Los Alamos was still very active. Now the computational research, uh, resources were certainly robust enough. The algorithms were getting better and better. They were being improved. Uh, the computer speed was the megaflop per giga, uh, to the gigaflop range. And the anticipated growth, as I mentioned, was almost uh, tenfold speed up every four years. So where were we? We were up in this region right here. And at the start of the 70s, we were well on our way to 10 times each, 3.8 years, or approximately over four years. But the reality started to set in, and look what happened. It's, uh, the computer resource capability started to level off for a period of time, and we were down to 10 times each nine years. So while one entered the 70s pretty optimistic about computer growth, after a few years and uh, looking back on it, the growth was not that fast. Now don't forget, we're looking at it back now 20 years later. When you're right in the middle of it, you don't always see these things. But this was the growth, the growth was leveling off right during this period here. <coughs> the other thing that started happening was, uh, and this is sort of a biased view, uh, there got to be too many turbulence models. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, if you look at a, the actual equation you're going to get if you're solving a two-equation turbulence models, there is, let's say, six coefficients. And if you're a person and somebody comes in and says, you know, I want you to predict, predict this flow, and you see that you're a little bit off, but you're pretty smart, and you know that if you change that coefficient a little bit and you can come right on, there's this great impetus to go in there and start as we know, adjusting constants, tuning constants. And that is really what hurt CFD from the turbulence modeling standpoint. It was really easy to go in and start adjusting coefficients that were not relevant to the calibration of the physics. <clears throat> so uh, basically, during this period, the seven, or certainly the early 70s, if you were sitting and doing turbulence modeling, that to you was CFD. That to you was CFD. Uh, 
And the models were based on one of two things, replicating observed phenomena or from first principles. Some people would call that replicating the physics. I never did. That's just replicating observed phenomena, which is not necessarily good physics. Uh, then at the same time, in the early 80s, to follow on, because of the success of the 68 Stanford Conference, it was an 81 Stanford Conference, but now it was complex turbulent flows. There were no examples of old-style integral methods from the early 60s, and it was just now, let's try as many flows as we can where we have experimental database. Uh, at the same time, large eddy simulations were starting to come online, as I mentioned, Tony Lehrer, but now they were starting to do some real problems, and of course they were now migrating to number one, which Smagorinsky had proposed to treat transient dynamics of the large-scale motions explicitly, and then to calculate the statistical uh, mechanics of the evolutions. So this all occurred in a relatively short amount of time. Okay, here's an example of some of the things that were done. Johnson King model is what would be termed a half equation model. I won't get into that. But here they have uh, a very weak shock behavior. I can't read the uh, captions here. But this is a relatively weak shock behavior and the models perform pretty well. But when, this, uh, when they got to a, um, uh, a stronger shock behavior, this is over a 2D airfoil. When they got to a stronger shock behavior, these models, the simpler models, tended to fall apart. Well, Johnson King had a very simple half equation model, and they were able to adjust it to boom, come pretty much on the experimental data. They had observed physical phenomena they needed to replicate. They changed the coefficients uh, to make it. On the other hand, there were this approach to these problems. I like to look at the previous slide as that's a CFD person. We would call them CFD people from the previous slide. These were physicists. This is Brian Lounder at the Imperial College uh, uh, with Reese and uh, Wolfgang Rohde, JFM 1975, a seminal paper because it really detailed how one would calibrate, let's say, the pressure strain rate correlation that appears in the turbulent transport equation. You can see that the models weren't all that good in some instances. This is the mean, this is the mean flow here on a mixing layer. This is the shear stress, and these are the normal stress components but these were calibrated on first principles. So if you're the engineer, you now have a choice. Do you take good physics and not do it completely right, or do you go back and take a flow like this, and this is weak physics, but it replicates the observed phenomena. That's the classic conflict people ran into for many, many years. What do we do about that situation? And um, in many cases, people opted for option one. And that means more and more models, more and more models. <clears throat> okay, LES, for those who may not be aware, some of the details of that. Basically, it's a low-pass filter. Remember I said earlier, filtered equations? Uh, I am, okay, I'll speed up. <laughs> uh, low-pass filter, instantaneous. They, people solve equations for filter variables. These equations for the, the filtered equations are in fact very much like the average equations. They're formally equivalent. So, and basically what you do is you count for energy transfer between the large and the small scales, and you have a fixed cutoff. Okay, 82,000, we now have DNS. Fire Eisen was the first person to do in DNS of a compressible homogeneous shear flow. 1981, he was Bill Reynolds' student. You can see that Bill Reynolds had a big impact when it came to simulations. Um, during this period, uh, 1880 to 2000, predictions of commercial reliance on RAND's model results increased. There were more commercial software companies started. If you look at the history of these commercial software companies, a lot of them got started in the 80s. Uh, model development migrated to be an academic exercise. And the industrial uses, users wanted more accurate results at minimal cost. They were getting too little return for over a decade of intense development and RANS modeling. The computer resources were available. And the question was, was LES the answer? And then, of course, now that the tool, the tool once again became available, let's do uh, DNS. They could do wide speed range. Uh, there were computer memory limitations. 
And if you look here, the number of grid points is proportional to the Reynolds number to the 9th fourth. Uh, the computer speed limitations uh, proportional to Reynolds number to the 3 quarters. So a complete simulation is proportional to a Reynolds number cubed. And for a commercial aircraft, uh, the Reynolds number uh, cubed, uh, Reynolds number is about 10 to the 8th. For a 747, it's about uh, uh, 10 to the 9th. And that would require 10 to the 4th uh, 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 clocks uh, to do the calculation. That was not going to be done. So, uh, and then what started happening, we started getting new computer architectures, clusters of pro uh, processors. Let me just migrate here a little bit. Yes. Let me go up here. Uh, now we have 1990 to 2030. We started on this path right here, these machines. We're now up to this range right here. In fact, the simulation I'll show you in a couple of slides is a blue gene P, which we're using uh, in Poitier. And next year, we'll come online a 10 pentaflop machine in 2011 to do uh, 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 human brain function simulation. And that'll come online in Japan next, uh, next year. Um, we have the maturity of LES, but there are still some limitations to uh, LES. You need DNS type resolution near your solid boundaries, and your subgrid scale models uh, may not properly capture the energy transfer. Um, let me just finish this off here. The, la the last thing that's coming online now is what's called hybrid methods, and I'll mention that in my conclusions in a couple of slides. We're going to have uh, hybrid methods, and they were started by Spillard in 1997 using his Spillard Almoros model. And the Spillard Almoros model is a eddy viscosity model. Remember, 1968, an eddy viscosity model. Uh, this was a film, I mean, a movie I was going to show, but we couldn't get this movie to work. This is LES type uh, results we have now. It's of a jet, and the background is pressure, a far field pressure fluctuations. So one of the big things in LES right now is calculating jet flow fields to correlate with acoustic radiation. That problem is still unsolved, I, I, identifying noise sources. The hybrid methods, the big thing coming up is whether you use zonal methods, that is, you pick a region of the flow and draw a line and try to interface between LES and RANs, or do you use global or seamless methods, where it's a smooth transition based on the modeling you have. So that requires you to go from a cutoff to up to DNS resolution or RANs resolution. And uh, just to show you why you need this, here's a 2D steady RANs if a flow over a cylinder. 2D unsteady RANs, you get some structure. 3D unsteady RANs, a little more structure, but you still don't get the right answer. And that's something like a hybrid method. One of the most popular is attached any simulation. OK. Um, I'm going to skip uh, the results. And let me, I did comment on the, uh, and let me just go to the epilogue. That's the conclusions. <laughs> um, first off, CNS has, uh, CFD has evolved. The, do, uh, the tool and the computer have, uh, has, have evolved. The theory have, has evolved to a lesser extent. That is, we've not been successful in really migrating all these equilibrium assumptions to non-equilibrium dynamics. Uh, the popularity of the methodologies have evolved. RANs, or average methods, dominated the late 60s and late 80s. Scale resolving methods, LES, popular the last two decades. And now, uh, which is a slide I skipped, DNS is getting to a point where we're really probing very well D, uh, uh, high speed flows. Uh, DNS will continue as an important diagnostic tool across the speed range, higher Reynolds numbers, higher Mach numbers. We're doing hypersonic flows now. Scale resolving methods will become more dominant. I think LES is going to diminish in its original framework and replace with hybrid methods. Zonal or seamless uh, will become the more practical tool. Uh, RANs will continue as a viable commercial tool across many disciplines, but models will need to be upgraded. Thank you very much.